Lesson seventy three. Concessive clauses. Review of the subjunctive and subordinate clauses. Caesar, Book One, Chapter Twelve, Concluded. Hi everyone, welcome back to Linny's Latin class. Today we're on page two seventeen, and this is the last lecture in the series. The textbook has seventy three lessons, and this is number seventy three. So this is the last one in the series. And in this last lesson, we'll review concessive clauses, and we'll also read more from Caesar's Gallic Wars. So let's start out with some vocabulary. In section five sixty eight, we have custos, custodis, which means guard or spy. Of course, our English word custodian is related to that. Also, words like custody. Next, we have quantus, quanta, quantum. Which means how much or how great. You can also see it used as a correlative, along with tantus, tanta, tantum. For example, if I have a friend who loves to drink Coca Cola, but I love to drink coffee, I could say to my friend, "As much as you like Coca Cola, that's how much I like coffee." So you're saying, however much that is, is however much this other thing is. So in Latin texts, you'll see sentences like that, and they're using tantus and quantus together as a pair, as a correlatives. We have an adverb aliter, which means otherwise. Moving to the top of the right-hand column, cum, meaning although, in a concessive clause. Of course, we've studied that many times, and we'll be reviewing that、uh, in this lesson. Etsy means even if or although. It's really a combination of the word et and the word c.、Si. Quamquam can also mean although. And then tamen is a very common word, which can mean yet, or nevertheless, or still. So when you're memorizing tamen, just think yet, nevertheless, or still, and it will pretty much always mean one of those three things. Lastly, we have skio, skire, skiwi, skitum, which means to know. That's related to lots of English words, like science. You know, the Latin word for knowledge is scientia, which is related to this. And so we have words like science. Earlier in the lecture series, we saw conscius. So we have English words like conscience or conscious. Also, words like prescient—that's P-R-E plus skio to know in advance. So, lots of related English words there. Let's move on now to section five sixty-nine, and we'll review concessive clauses. It says here a subordinate clause beginning with a conjunction, meaning though, although, is called concessive. Why is it called concessive? Because you're conceding something. You're conceding or granting that one thing is true, but then you're saying, in spite of that thing, this other thing happened. So while you concede that this one thing is true, you're also adding that this other thing is true, perhaps. And so when you draw that distinction, that kind of clause is called a concessive clause because you're conceding that something is true, which may go against the rest of the thing that you're mentioning. If you have a concessive clause and then a main clause, the things happening in the concessive clause will be at odds with the things happening in the main clause. They'll be working against each other. So the structure of the sentence gets set up in such a way where you're putting two things in opposition. For example, if everyone else wants pizza but you don't like pizza, you might say, "Although I do not like pizza." Nevertheless, I ordered it because everyone else wanted pizza. So you're conceding or granting the fact that you don't like pizza, but nevertheless, there's this other thing that is true in spite of that that you ordered it because everyone else wanted it. So let's take a look at a few example sentences here in section five sixty nine. In section A at the bottom of page two seventeen, we have quam quam. Plus an indicative clause. 
So quam quam milites sunt pauci, tamen fortiter pugnant. Again, quam quam means although. So quam quam means although, milites means soldiers, sunt means they are, and then pauci means few. So although the soldiers are few, and then tamen means yet, nevertheless, or still. Pugnat is they fight, or they are fighting. That's present tense. And then fortiter means bravely. So although the soldiers are few, nevertheless, they are fighting bravely. So you see in this kind of sentence, the concessive clause and the main clause are at odds with each other. You're saying that one thing is true in spite of the fact that this other thing is true. So that's the structure or the feeling of these uh, concessive kinds of examples here. Moving to the top of page 218, section B, indicative or subjunctive with etsi, etiamsi, tametsi. These are all words that mean although. And so we have an example sentence here. Kaisar, etsi in his locis, maturai sunt hiemes, tamen in Britanniam, ire contendit. Here we have the word heamps, which means winter. It's plural here, so heames means winters, and then sunt means they are, and then maturai means early. That's modifying heames, and in his locis means in these places. So although in these places winters are early, Nevertheless, that's Tamen. Nevertheless, in Britanniam, that means into Britain. And then the verb contendo can mean strive, fight, or hasten. Here it means hasten. And it looks like it's perfect tense. So it says, he hastened. And then ire, to go. And then in Britanniam. So he hastened to go into Britain. So here, again, we have a main clause, and then in the middle of that, a concessive clause. Although the winters are early, nevertheless, he hurried into Britain. So although this thing is true, this other thing happened anyway. That's kind of the structure of it. And then in section C, we find the good old-fashioned cum clause with a subjunctive verb, which we've studied a million times. So let's read the example sentence. Cum ea ita sent, tamen kaisar pakem faciet. So we start out with a cum clause, that's cum plus the subjunctive. It could be circumstantial, causal, or concessive. In this particular case, it's concessive because we're practicing concessive clauses in this lesson. Ea is a neuter plural form of is ea id. It means these things. Again, we see the neuter gender being used to talk about indefinite things or inanimate things. Itta means something like thus or so. And then sent is the subjunctive verb. It's like sunt, but subjunctive. So although these things are thus, or although these things are so, and then we have tamen kaisar pakem fakiet. Fakiet is future tense of the verb facio, which means do or make. It's third person singular. So it means he, she, or it will make. Kaisar is the subject. Pakim is accusative singular. That's pax pakis, the uh, third declension noun that means peace. And tamen is yet, nevertheless, or still. So yet, or nevertheless, Caesar will, a future tense, Caesar will make peace. So that's a classic case of a cum clause with a subjunctive verb being a cum concessive. We've seen lots and lots of cum causal clauses, and we've even seen a few cum circumstantial, but we have not seen very many cum concessive. So this is a good chance to just uh, take a little pit stop here and, and study what a cum concessive clause could look like. Now in section 570, let's do a big review of all the different ways to use the subjunctive in subordinate clauses. In number one, we have clauses of purpose. 
So a classic purpose clause is going to start out with ut and then a subjunctive verb to express for the purpose that or so that such and such happens. And if you want to have it negated, in other words, so that something does not happen, you'll use ne to negate it because ne is the thing you use to negate a subjunctive verb. Non will negate an indicative verb, but ne is for subjunctive verbs. Number two, result clauses. The box was so heavy that I could not lift it. Okay, when you have descriptions like that, like it was so heavy, oftentimes after that you'll have a result clause. So what you're saying is that the box was so heavy that the result of that was that I could not lift it. And so that will use ut plus a subjunctive verb. Number three is next. Here they're talking about relative clauses of characteristic. That's the kind of relative clause that has a subjunctive verb, and you can use it to talk about not actual action, but you can use it to characterize someone and say they're the kind of person who does something, or you can characterize a thing. You can say that road is the kind of road that is so narrow you can only get one cart at a time through it. So a relative clause with a subjunctive verb can be used to characterize something, and so we call that a relative clause of characteristic. Number four, we have temporal clauses. That's what they're talking about, talking about timing, when something happens. So you can use cum. Really, with cum, you're supposed to use an indicative verb if it's really a cum temporal. But antequam means before, priusquam means before, dum means while. Donek can mean while or as long as or until. And quoad can mean as long as or until. So all those words that describe time, those can all form a temporal clause with a subjunctive verb. And that's a subordinate clause. Number five is next. We've talked about cum clauses a million times. So cum clauses with subjunctive verbs can be circumstantial, causal, or concessive, as we studied above in section C of uh, section 569. Number seven, clauses using the subjunctive that are part of conditions. You'll see subjunctive verbs in conditionals that are contrary to fact. Also, in a future less vivid construction, you can see subjunctive verbs. Number eight, noun clauses depending on verbs, meaning command, persuade, urge, induce, fear. So we can have sentences saying things like, I persuaded them that they go out of their homeland. Or, I fear that something will happen. When it's part of a command or when it's persuading, we call that really an indirect command. And the recipe for an indirect command is a verb of commanding or asking or demanding, and then the word ut, and then a verb in the subjunctive. So if I want to say, I demand that you praise, I could say posco, which means I demand, and then ut, and then laudes, which is second person singular subjunctive. So I demand that you praise. Posco ut laudes. So that's a classic case of an indirect command. But you can also see this with other verbs like urge, induce, fear. You know, we've talked about clauses of fearing. Also in Allen and Greenow, we saw ut clauses that work with verbs of resolving, verbs of determining, verbs of deciding. We saw that kind of thing too. For example, the council resolved or decided that they would, you know, do blah, blah, blah. So those kinds of situations can generate an ut clause with a subjunctive verb. Number nine, indirect questions. A direct question involves an interrogative, like, when is the party? That's a direct question. But then if you repeat that question secondhand, 
to someone else, perhaps your friend Fred says, when is the party? And then Sheila says, what did he say? And then you repeat that to Sheila. You can say, he's asking when the party is. Now, in this new sentence, the part of the sentence that says, when the party is, that's called an indirect question. And really, you could word it in its original form. You could say, he is asking, when is the party? That's really more of a quote and perhaps not very good English. Nevertheless, it, it still communicates what's being asked. In English, when we convert a direct question into an indirect question, we often flip around the word order. So, when is the party becomes, he is asking when the party is. So, we put the verb at the end, and the word is ends up somehow at the end of the sentence. But anyway, the question at that point in the new sentence becomes an indirect question. And so, in Latin, an indirect question will be a subordinate clause, and it will have a subjunctive verb. Finally, number 10 says, subordinate clauses of indirect discourse. The general rule is that subordinate clauses in indirect discourse are supposed to be in the subjunctive. That's the general rule. But there are some exceptions to that. If you want to read more about it, you can read section 586 of Allen and Greenow. So generally speaking, subordinate clauses in indirect speech take a subjunctive verb, generally speaking, with a couple of exceptions. And you can read more about those if you want. So let's move on now to section 571, and let's do our translation exercises for this lesson. We only have 10 exercises, so go ahead and turn off the recording and do all 10 of them. And when you're ready, turn the recording back on, and we'll go over them together. Okay, hopefully by now you've completed your homework in section 571. Let's go over these exercises together, starting with number one. Fiebat ut omnes galli comoerentur. Fiebat is a form of the verb fio. Fio is the passive department of the verb facio. Facio is active. It means to do or make. And then fio means to be made or be done. So fio covers all the passive forms of facio. And since something is being made or being done, that verb can mean things like become or happen. So here we have fiebat, which is imperfect tense, followed by an ut clause. So here we can translate fiebat as it was happening, or it happened, or perhaps it so happened, or it came to pass. Fiebat, we'll translate it as it happened, and then ut means that, and then omnes gali means all Gauls, or all the Gauls, and then como verentur. That's the verb komoeo, which means to be disturbed, be stirred up, to be alarmed. So this is imperfect subjunctive, third person plural passive. So all the Gauls were stirred up, all the Gauls were alarmed. From an analytical standpoint, this kind of sentence really is a result clause. The kind of result clauses that we're accustomed to seeing most are the kind like, the box was so heavy that I could not lift it. That's your basic garden variety result clause. But here we have a result clause with fiebat, with something happening. So really, ut omnes gali como verentur. That's really a result clause, and that's why it's a subordinate clause with ut and has a subjunctive verb. So number one says, it happened that all the Gauls were alarmed. Number two, intelligo quanto cum periculo id fecerim. Intelligo means I 
perceive, I understand, I learn, I realize. And then we have quanto cum periculo. If we reorder that, it says cum quanto periculo, with how much danger. Quantus quanta quantum is one of our new words for this lesson. We learned about that in uh, section 568. That's our vocabulary for this lesson. And so what this looks like to me is an indirect question. If it were a direct question, it would be, with how much danger? You know, how much danger was there? But here it's being phrased as a subordinate clause. Fekerem is the verb facio in the perfect tense, first person singular. So I did, and then id is the direct object. So id fekerem says, I did it. So the sentence as a whole says, I realize with how much danger I did it. I guess in this sentence, someone is talking about some dangerous thing they did, and they're saying, you know, I realize just how much danger there was when I did this thing. So in Latin, what we get is an indirect question, the idea of, with how much danger did you do it? That direct question gets converted into an indirect question, and so we get a subjunctive verb, and it becomes a subordinate clause. So, I realize with how much danger I did it. Number three is next. Dice se intelegere quanto cum periculo id fecerit. Now we have that whole sentence from number two, but converted into indirect speech, starting with dicit, that's a he, she, or it says, and then starting with se, se is the subject accusative, intelegere is the infinitive, that's the verb within the indirect speech. So assuming it's a he, let's say he says that he realizes, everything's present tense, so he says that he realizes, and now we have another subordinate clause, it's still the same indirect question, except uh, fakerit is third person instead of first person, like fakerim. We're not really changing fakerit from indicative to subjunctive. So even in the original clause, this was already subjunctive because it was already an indirect question. So here, we're just keeping it in the subjunctive because it was already subjunctive in the original. So number three says, he says that he realizes with how much danger he did it. Probably not very good English, but nevertheless, it does a good job of communicating what the Latin is saying. In number four, I'm afraid we have a clause of fearing. Diwikiacus veretur ne caesar opidis hadiorum potiatur. Here we have the verb vereor, which means to fear its deponent. So, Diwikiacus veretur says, Diwikiacus fears. And then with ne, we're going to read what he fears will happen. If it's got ut, then the next thing tells you what the person is afraid will not happen. So within the clause of fearing, we have Kaisar doing something. The verb potior is here. That's potiatur. Potior is one of the puffy verbs. That is, uh, deponent verbs that work with the ablative. Puffy is an acronym. It's really puff V. Potior, utor, fruor, fungor, weiskor. Those five are the puff V deponent verbs. And so potior will take the ablative. And it means to seize or to take possession of. Opidis is ablative plural. That's the thing being seized. And then haiduorum is of the haidui. So number four says, Diwikiakas fears that Caesar is seizing the towns of the haidui. How did it get to the point where nay tells you what you're afraid will happen? 
Well, break it down into two separate clauses, and that will help you figure it out. Duikiakis veretur. Duikiakis fears. Let Caesar not take possession, or let Caesar not seize the towns of the Haidui. So if you break it into two clauses, it helps you see how the grammar adds up. That's a little trick you can do with clauses of fearing. Number five is next. Domnorigi custodes ponet ut quae agat scire posit. Here we have a main clause and then a purpose clause. We don't have an explicitly stated subject. It's just ponet, which means he, she, or it is putting, he, she, or it is placing, he, she, or it is putting something somewhere. And custodes apparently is the direct object. That means guards. So he, she, or it is placing guards. That's what we have so far. And dumnorigi is dative singular. So he's the recipient of the guards. It could be some kind of dative of reference in the sense of he's putting guards somewhere for Dumnerix, for the benefit of Dumnerix. But the guards aren't there just to keep him safe. There are ulterior motives. Ut quae agat scire posit. That's a purpose clause telling us why someone is stationing guards with Dumnerix. So ut means that or so that, and then posit is a subjunctive form of posum. So he, she, or it might be able, and then skire means to know. That's one of our new words for this lesson, the verb skio. So ut, posit, and skire together will say, so that he might be able to know. And then embedded within this, we have an indirect question, quae agat. Agat is a subjunctive form of the verb ago, which means to do. That's present tense. And then quae is a neuter plural form of qui. Because it's neuter and accusative plural, it carries the idea of what things. So basically it says he is putting, or perhaps stationing might be a better way. He is stationing guards for Dumnerix so that he might know what he is doing. Posit. The subject of that verb is the same person who's putting out the guards, but then agat, the subject of that one, is dumnerix. So the person stationing the guards, he's really putting them there as spies. So someone is putting guards there so they can keep an eye on dumnerix and then report back what he's doing. That's the context. So quai agat is an indirect question. That's why agat is subjunctive. If it were a direct question, it would be quid agit, what is he doing? Or in the plural, quae agit, what things, in the plural, what plural things is he doing? But then when it gets converted into an indirect question, the verb becomes subjunctive. So quae agat is an indirect question, and the whole thing says he is stationing guards for Dumnerix so that he might be able to know what he is doing. And quai is plural, so it might be what things he is doing. Number six is next. Non dubium errat, queen Romani, helvetios superaturi essent. The word dubium can be a noun that means a doubt, or it can be an adjective that means doubtful. So non dubium erat could say it was not doubtful, or it could mean there was not a doubt. Either way, it means the same thing. There was no doubt. And then queen, after a verb of doubting, means something like that or but that. So there was no doubt but that the Romani, the Romans, and then superaturi essent, that's the verb supero, which means to conquer. Superaturi is a future active participle. 
So that means about to conquer. Notice that it's masculine nominative plural because it has to match Romani. And then essent is an imperfect subjunctive verb. So literally it says there was no doubt that the Romans were about to conquer the Helwetii. That's literally what it says. But as we render this into English, if we keep that same kind of wording, it's going to sound very wooden. So the word would would help us here. So there was no doubt that the Romans would conquer the Helwetii. The word would communicates the subjunctive nature of it and the fact that it's something that would happen in the future. Because erat, the main verb here, that puts us into the past. But then superaturi looks from that past point in time to the future. So the idea is that there was no doubt that the Romans were going to conquer in the future the Helwetii. So we can say that elegantly in English with, there was no doubt that the Romans would conquer the Helwetii. Number seven is next. Helwetii cum agmen caesaris uno die ararem transise intelligerent comoti sunt. Here we have a main clause, which is Helwetii comoti sunt, and then Embedded in the middle of that, we have a subordinate clause. It's a cum clause with a subjunctive verb. So the main clause says, Helwetii komoti sunt. That means the Helwetii were alarmed. The verb here is komoeo. Komoeo means to agitate, to strongly move something, to set in motion, to throw into disorder, things like that. So, komoti sunt is perfect tense and passive, third person plural. It's a compound tense. You need two words to make it, the perfect passive participle plus a present tense form of sum. So, komoti sunt says they were stirred up, they were thrown into disorder, or perhaps they were alarmed. That might be a good way to translate it. So the Helwetii were alarmed. That's the main clause. And then we have this cum clause in the middle. Cum agmen caesaris uno die ararem transise intelligerent. So cum plus the subjunctive, that's going to be either circumstantial, causal, or concessive. Footnote one at the bottom reminds us of the way the authors of this book would like you to translate this kind of cum clause. They want it to be when, since, or although. I have been trying to steer you toward translating these clauses as under the circumstances that, since, or although. Why do I do that? Because the kind of clause that they want to translate as when it's really called a cum circumstantial. It's talking about circumstances. So really, what it's saying is under the circumstances that when you translate cum as when, even though it's a circumstantial clause, it makes it sound like there's a time relationship that may not actually be there. Also, a true cum temporal clause has an indicative verb, not a subjunctive one. So I was taught to translate a cum circumstantial, translating the word cum as under the circumstances that. Anyway, the main verb within this cum clause is intelligerent. That's imperfect subjunctive, and it means to realize. So the Helwetii realized. And so once we have intelligerent, once they realize something, that puts us into indirect speech, or at least something similar to it with an accusative plus infinitive construction. So agmen is the accusative subject, and then transise is the infinitive verb. 
Tronzise is trans plus ao, trans ao, to go across. And then ararim is the accusative singular form of the rr river. So in the part of the sentence that has the accusative plus infinitive construction, we have Agmen Caesares Transise. The army of Caesar crossed. And since intelegerent is in the past and transise is perfect tense, let's use the pluperfect. Let's say had crossed. So the army of Caesar had crossed the RR. And then uno die is an ablative of time, more specifically, an ablative of time within which. There are two flavors of ablative of time. One is the ablative of time when. That tells you when something happened. And then there's the apparently less frequent ablative of time within which, which tells you an amount of time within which something occurred or will occur. And so here, uno die reads like an ablative of time within which. So within the span of one day or within one day. So this sentence, uh, depending on how we translate cum, could read one of three ways. If we read cum as starting a cum circumstantial, it could say this. And let's put together helwete e and komoti sunt. So the helwete e were alarmed under the circumstances that they realized that the army of Caesar had crossed the RR or the Son within one day. Kind of clunky and maybe not the best translation. Let's try cum causal. The Helwetii were alarmed because they realized that the army of Caesar had crossed the Son within one day. That sounds pretty good. Let's try cum concessive just for learning. Let's experiment and see what happens. The Helwetii were alarmed, although they realized that the army of Caesar had crossed the Son within one day. That doesn't really make any sense because it doesn't set those two facts at odds with one another. They actually go together. So the causal way and the circumstantial way are the best ways to do it. And actually, translating cum as when actually might be a pretty good idea here. It kind of feels right. The Helwetii were alarmed when they realized that the army of Caesar had crossed the Son within one day. You know, that actually works pretty well here. Even though I don't really like to translate cum circumstantials like that, I must admit here it actually sounds pretty good. So let's treat this as a cum circumstantial, and just this once, let's translate it as when. So the Helwetii were alarmed when they realized that the army of Caesar had crossed the Son in one day. Number eight is next. Cum prohaeduis bellum suscaperit, quod ab eis non sublevetur, queretur. So this sentence has a main clause and then two subordinate clauses, one of which is a cum clause, the other of which is a causal clause. So really the main sentence here consists only of one word, that's queretur. There's no explicitly stated subject. Queretur is the verb queror, which is a deponent verb. It means to complain. It's present tense. So queretur by itself means he, she, or it is complaining. Let's take a look at this cum clause. We have cum plus a subjunctive verb. So scaperit is a perfect tense subjunctive of the verb suscipio, which means to undertake. So this cum clause will read, under the circumstances that, because, or although, he undertook. And what did he undertake? Bellum, which is war. And then we have a prepositional phrase, pro haiduis. Pro is a preposition that takes the ablative. 
And pro can mean lots of different things. It can mean in place of, on behalf of, instead of. It can even mean in front of. It can mean in accordance with, in proportion to. Oftentimes, it gets translated merely as for. But really, for is not always the best way to translate it. It's better to give it a more descriptive, more specific kind of translation. And this is actually a good spot to demonstrate this. In this particular spot, it means on behalf of. So this cum clause will read, under the circumstances that, since, or although, he undertook war on behalf of the Haidui. Okay, so the idea is someone is fighting someone for the Haidui, perhaps as a mercenary, you know, as an ally, a military ally, or a mercenary army. They're taking up war on behalf of someone else, on behalf of the Haidui. So that's the sense of it. Let's take a look at the rest of the sentence. It's a causal clause, quod ab eis non sublevetur. So this is the verb sublewo, which means to assist or help. Sublevetur is present tense, subjunctive, third person, singular, and it's passive too. So it means he, she, or it is not being assisted, or he, she, or it is not being helped, you know, along with the word known. Ab eis is an ablative of agent. It means by them, and the them is referring to the haidui. So this causal clause here, it's a subordinate clause with a subjunctive verb. It says, because he is not being helped by them. This is probably a reference to when Caesar tries to defend the Haidui, and then has trouble getting grain. So I think that's the context. He gets mad at them for not giving him enough supplies. So he undertakes war on behalf of the Haidui, and then it says he doesn't get enough help from them. So how should we translate cum? It's starting to look like a cum concessive clause. So let's try that. Let's try reading cum as although, and it's a cum concessive clause. Although he undertook war on behalf of the Haidui, because he is not being helped by them, he is complaining. So this is a cum concessive clause. We have two things at odds with each other. First of all, he undertook war for them willingly, but he's complaining about it. So those two things are set at odds with one another. And as you translate pro into English, you could say, although he undertook war for the Haidui, and that works, but it's just not nearly as good as if you say on behalf of. Saying that he undertook war on behalf of the Haidui is much clearer and more descriptive than he undertook war for the Haidui. Oftentimes, younger students will translate pro merely as for, but you can do much better with it, is what I'm trying to say. So let's translate number eight like this. Although he undertook war on behalf of the Haidui, because he is not being helped by them, he is complaining. Or you could change the word order around a bit and say, he is complaining because he is not being helped by them. Number nine is next. Cum abhora septima ad vesperum pugnatum sit, aversum hostum videre nemo potuit. Here we have a main clause and then a subordinate clause. The subordinate clause is cum up through the word sit. So let's take a look at the main clause first. The subject is nemo, which means nobody, and potuit is the verb posum which means to be able, and this is perfect tense, third person singular. So Nemo and Potuit together say, nobody was able, or no one was able. Complementary infinitive, videre, so no one was able to see, 
and then Hostum is the direct object. So no one was able to see the enemy. And then we have this adjective here, adversum. It's really a perfect passive participle of the verb a huerto. Huerto means to turn, and then a means from. So it really means uh, to turn away. So literally, it says no one was able to see the turned away enemy. So let's translate it like this. No one was able to see the fleeing enemy. Then we have a cum clause with a subjunctive verb. We need to figure out how we're going to translate cum. The verb within the cum clause is this impersonal form of pugno. We studied this before. The verb pugno in the passive, like a pugnatur in the present tense, can mean it is being fought in the sense of there is fighting occurring or there is fighting going on. So when you say pugnatur, it's an impersonal use of that verb. It is fought or it is being fought. It's impersonal because there's no person doing any fighting. It's just talking about ongoing action. So here we have that kind of thing. It's an impersonal verb, but it's in the past uh, in the perfect tense. So being perfect tense, we can translate pugnatum sit as there was fighting. Literally, it was being fought, but we can translate it as fighting was going on or there was fighting going on. Notice also that this is a gendered verb, and so pugnatum is neuter. The neuter gender of it helps to communicate the impersonal nature of what the verb is communicating. If it were pugnatus sit, that wouldn't make any sense. There's no boy or man being fought. That doesn't make any sense. It's not pugnata sit. There's no woman being fought. That doesn't make any sense either. It's just there is fighting occurring. So pugnatum, as a neuter participle, it fits the impersonal feeling of what's being communicated. We have a couple of prepositional phrases talking about time. Ab hora septima, that means from the seventh hour. And then ad vesperum means to evening. The seventh hour, I believe, is around 1 p.m. in the afternoon. So they're saying here that the battle was going on all afternoon long from about 1 p.m. all the way to evening. So perhaps five or six hours of battle, depending on what time of year it is. So this sentence will read, under the circumstances that, since, or although fighting was going on from the seventh hour to evening, no one was able to see the fleeing enemy. It feels like the two parts of this sentence are at odds with each other. So it feels like a concessive clause. Let's try that. Although fighting was going on from the seventh hour to evening, no one was able to see the fleeing enemy. And if you want to get fancy here, you could even think of awersum along with esse and make it into an infinitive, a perfect tense, passive infinitive. Then you would have hostem as a subject accusative and awersum esse as an infinitive, and that would give you an accusative plus infinitive construction. So potentially you could do this. No one was able to see that the enemy was turned away. I'm just throwing that out there for your consideration. I'm not saying to translate it that way. So the context of this sentence isn't really all that clear, but there's one thing that can help us, and that is to translate hostem as just one of the enemies. If you think back all the times that we've seen Caesar talk about the enemy, it's always been in the plural. He's always talked about hostes or hostibus, but here, for the first time, it's hostem, which is singular. You know, these exercises are mostly taken straight from Caesar's Gallic Wars. 
they're shortened or simplified, but still they're taken basically from the text. And so what the second half of the sentence is saying is that no one was able to see an enemy soldier, in other words, one enemy, awaresome, turned and fleeing in the opposite direction. So the context of this sentence is commending the bravery of the enemy. They're saying that the enemy was really brave, and even though the battle raged all afternoon, no one could see an enemy awaresome, turned away, running away, fleeing. So that's the context. The enemy was so brave that they didn't flee or run, even in the context of many hours of hard battle. Again, the footnote for awaresome says fleeing. Literally, it's turned away. But the idea is no one's fleeing, no one's running away. So one way we could translate this is uh, to say awaresome means with your back turned. So let's try this. Although there was fighting going on from the seventh hour to evening, no one was able to see an enemy with his back turned. In other words, no one saw any enemy soldiers behaving in a cowardly fashion and running away from the battlefield. Number 10 is next. Kaisar et si difficultatem faciendi pontis skiret propter latitudinem rapiditatem altitudinemque fluminis tamen aliter non traducindum exercitum existemabat. Here we have Etsy and Tamen working together as a team, sort of like correlatives, I guess. Etsy means although, and then Tamen means yet, nevertheless, or still. So the structure of the sentence is two parts. Although such and such happened, nevertheless, this other thing happened. So it's got a concessive kind of feeling to it. So the main clause here, Really, the skeleton of it is kaisar and existemabat. The verb existemo means to think in the sense of suppose or reckon. And existemabat is imperfect tense, third person singular. So the skeleton of the main clause is Caesar was thinking or Caesar was reckoning. And then we go into indirect speech with exercitum as the subject accusative, that means army, and then non traducindum, that's a future passive participle, and we need to read into that the word esse to make it an infinitive. The verb is trans plus duco, to lead across, but it ends up as traduco. Traducindum plus esse means to be led across, So Caesar was thinking that the army was not to be led across, in the sense of the army must not be led across, and then aliter means otherwise, or perhaps in some other way. That might be a good way to render it. And then tamen means nevertheless, and that brings us into this last part of the sentence. Now let's look at the concessive clause in the middle. Starting with et si, that means although. Skiret is an imperfect subjunctive form of the verb skio, which means to know. And then difficultatem means difficulty, and that's the direct object of skiret. So although he knew the difficulty, and then we have a gerundive, faciendi, along with pontus, those are both genitive. So it means. Although he knew the difficulty of a bridge to be built, again, faciendi is a gerundive, also known as a future passive participle. But for smoother English, we need to make pontus a bridge. We need to make that the direct object and then make faciendi active. So Caesar, although he knew the difficulty of building a bridge, Then we have near the end, Tamen, nevertheless, he was thinking that the army ought not be led across 
any other way. That's really what the sentence is saying. So it has a strong concessive force coming from Etsy. Finally, we have a couple of prepositional phrases. Propter means on account of, and latitudinem means with. Rapiditatem means speed. And then altitudinemque, the que ending provides the word and. And altitudinem can mean height or depth. When you're talking about water, like rivers and streams and oceans, altitudo often means depth. And all this is working with fluminous, which is genitive. It means of the river. So starting with propter, on account of the width, speed, and depth of the river. So number 10 altogether says, Caesar, although he knew the difficulty of building a bridge, literally of a bridge to be built, on account of the width, the speed, and the depth of the river, Nevertheless, he was thinking that the army ought not be led across in some other way. And I'm taking a little bit of liberty with Alatair. So we could say he was thinking that the army must not be led across or that the army ought not be led across. Any of those kinds of translations will work fine. Let's move on now to section 573 and finish up chapter 12 of book 1. In the previous reading, we read that Caesar and his troops, I believe three legions, had set out from their base in the middle of the night, and they're heading up to where the Helwetii are trying to cross the river. Three quarters of them had crossed and were now on the west side of the Sone, but one quarter of them are still on the east side of the Sone. And Caesar now is going to attack them. So let's jump into the beginning here. Eos impeditos et opinantes ad gressus magnam partem eorum concidit. There is no explicitly stated subject, but we know it's Julius Caesar. Concidit means he killed or he cut down. Actually, concidit here could be present tense or perfect tense. They're both spelled exactly the same. It looks like it's perfect tense. And the direct object is magnam partem. So he cut down a great part, and then aorum is of them, referring to the Helwetii. So this is that one quarter of the Helwetii that was still remaining on the east side of the Sone. So he cut down a great part of them. And then we have sort of a parenthetical clause here at the beginning. Eos impeditos et inopinantes ad gressus. Ad gressus is a form of the verb agredior, which means to approach. It's a deponent verb. And so this is a perfect tense participle. It means having approached. And the direct object of ad gressus is eos, which means the helwetii. We can translate eos as them. So, having approached them, he cut down a great number of them. Impeditos and opinantes both modify eos. Impeditos means that they're burdened with baggage and burdened with lots of stuff that they're trying to transport. So we could translate impeditos as laden with baggage. And inopinantes means that they're not expecting him. So the first few words here say, having approached them laden with baggage and not expecting him, impeditos is a first and second declension adjective. Inopinantes is a third declension adjective. Inopinans. It's probably just a present participle of some verb that's found its way as an adjective. So anyway, we could translate the whole thing like this. Having approached them laden with baggage and not expecting him, he cut down a great part of them. Moving along, 
Reliqui sese fugai mandarunt, atque in proximas silvas abdiderunt. The subject here is reliqui, that means the rest of them, the remainder. We have a syncopated form, mandarunt, that's mandawerunt. So that's a syncopated perfect tense form. And along with sese and fugai, it forms an idiom. Mando means to, well, it can mean different things like order or entrust or consign or commit. So literally, they committed themselves to flight. In English, we say sometimes they took to flight. I think the authors of this book have told us to translate this idiom as to betake oneself to flight. Then we have the verb abdo, which means to put away or hide. That's in the vocabulary below. So abdiderunt is perfect tense. It says they hid, and then in proximas silvas says into the nearest woods. So Caesar and his troops kill many of the Helwetii that are on the east side of the Sone. And then it says, picking up with reliqui, it says the remaining ones betook themselves to flight and hid in the nearest woods. And here's where Julius Caesar talks about the four different districts or cantons of Helvetia. He says, Is pagus appellator tigorinus. Pagus means district or canton. That's the name for the four different districts, is the word pagus. That means district. And so is is functioning here as a demonstrative adjective. So is pagus means this district or this canton. He's envisioning the people that were on the east side of the Sone River as one of those four districts of the Helwetii. So he says, Apelabatur, this district was named. That's the verb apello, which means to name. And it's third person singular, passive, and imperfect tense. So this district or this canton was named Tigorinus. Moving on. Nam omnis kiwitas helvetia in quatuor pagos divisa est. Nam means four. Omnis kiwitas says the entire state. And then duisa est is a perfect tense passive verb of the verb duido. So it says the entire state was divided. And then in quatuor pagos into four districts or into four cantons. So literally for the entire state, Helvetia, was divided into four cantons. Moving along, we have hic pagus unus cum domo exiset. Here we have a cum clause with a subjunctive verb. Exiset is the verb ex eo, which means to go out. It's just ex plus eo, literally to go out. And this is pluperfect subjunctive. Hic pagus means this district or this canton. And it's got unus there. So it means this one canton or this one district. Domo is ablative of separation. It means from home. So this cum clause will read, under the circumstances that this one district had gone out from home, or since this one district had gone out from home, or although this one district had gone out from home. It's going to be under the circumstances that, since, or although. We'll circle back to this. And then in the main clause, uh, let's keep reading. Patrum nostrorum memoria lucium cassium consulum interfecerat et eus exercitum sub jugum miserat. So this one canton or this one district, they had done two things, interfecerat and miserat. Interficio means to kill. Interfecerat is pluperfect. 
So this district, this one district, had killed Lucius Cassius, the consul. Remember that in ancient Rome, each year they had basically two presidents that would serve together, and they were called consuls. That was the top head of state in ancient Rome during the Republic. And so Lucius Cassius was consul, and he took his army north to fight against the Gauls. And this one particular canton called Tigorinus, this one uh, particular canton had gotten into a battle and defeated the Romans, and they killed the consul. So this is kind of a big deal, very humiliating for the Romans. And so this is part of the reason why Julius Caesar is holding a grudge against the Helvetii, is because of this past event that happened, this humiliation from approximately 50 years before. The word patrum is genitive plural. That means of the fathers. And it's being modified by nostrorum. So it's of our fathers. And memoria means in the memory or within the memory. And so in the memory or within the memory of our fathers, it means that it was recent enough that the men of Caesar's generation, that is the fathers of the men of Caesar's generation, would have remembered it. So Lucius Cassius, uh, his full name is Lucius Cassius Longinus. And so he was consul in 107 BC. The story we're reading occurs in 58 BC. So it's almost 50 years exactly since this event occurred. So I think now we have enough information to translate the cum here in the cum clause. It looks to me like a cum circumstantial. So under the circumstances that this one district had gone out from home, they had killed Lucius Cassius, the consul, within the memory of our fathers. Now we have the conjunction et, and then one more thing that this district did, this one district, hic pagus unus. We have miserat, that's a form of mito, which means to send. So this is pluperfect. So pagus miserat says this district had sent. And the direct object is exercitum, which means army. Aeus means his, referring to Lucius Cassius. And then subyugum means under the yoke. It reads like this. And it had sent his army under the yoke. What does it mean that they sent them under the yoke? What they would do is to humiliate a defeated enemy. They would set up a special ceremony. They would take two spears and put them upright, and then another spear going across the top of those two spears, perhaps tied in place with rope or something. And then they would make the defeated army go under that wooden structure. The word yugum means yoke, like you would put on animals. If you put a yoke on an ox or a bull and you get them to pull your plow, you know, it's a symbol of submission. If an animal has a yoke on it, it means that animal has been, you know, subdued and tamed. So sending your enemies under the yoke could be humiliating them in the sense of you're showing that they've been tamed or domesticated like an animal. The basic idea is that it's a way to humiliate a defeated enemy, an enemy that's been defeated in battle. And so that's what this particular canton of the Helvetii did to the army of Lucius Cassius. So not only did they defeat the Roman army, not only did they kill the consul, but also they humiliated the Roman army with this a special going under the yoke ceremony. So this is a huge embarrassment and humiliation for the Romans. And obviously Caesar has not forgotten about it, and he's trying to tie it in to his narrative. You know, basically his army slaughtered 
men, women, and children. He's trying to portray it as if this district is somehow a military force. And they probably had fighting men, but ultimately they're just slaughtering people. I mean, these are not just men only. These are men, women, and children. So this is really a slaughter, but Caesar is trying to portray it in his narrative as this glorious thing that he's done for the Roman state, you know, that he's somehow righted a wrong. And again, we see the strong sense of entitlement. As I've said before, the ancient Romans really felt that they were just entitled to be in charge of everything. And so the attitude here is, how dare you defeat us? We're the Romans. How dare you defeat us and and kill our consul? Julius Caesar is portraying his attack on these people as something they deserved because they were destroying the property of the uh, Haidui and the Allobroges and the Ambari. He used the word copiarum to describe them, forces. And now he's talking about something they did 50 years ago. He's just trying to figure out any kind of way he can use to justify this wholesale slaughter of them. And furthermore, if you continue reading Caesar's Gallic Wars, you'll see this kind of scenario repeating itself over and over again as Caesar and his army encounters various Gallic tribes, such as the Belgians. You just see it over and over again. Moving on to the top of the next page, page 220, let's continue reading. Ita siwe casu siwe concilio deorum immortalium. Let's stop there. Again, here we see this strong sense of entitlement. So ita means thus, siwe, we see siwe twice. Uh, it means either and then or. So siwe, siwe is either or. Kasu means by chance. And then concilio means by plan. That's the ablative singular form of concilium. And then deorum means of the gods. That's genitive plural, and it's being modified by the third declension adjective, immortalium. Notice the I stem ending there for that genitive plural. So it reads like this. Thus, whether by chance or whether by the plan of the immortal gods. That time I said whether and or. You could say either or if you want. Thus, either by chance or by the plan of of the immortal gods. Moving on. Quae pars quitatis helvetiae in signum calamitatem populo romano in tulerat. This is a relative clause, but here we're seeing the antecedent parked inside the relative clause. So let's take a look here. Pars is the subject, and then quitatis helvetiae. I think helvetii is functioning here as an adjective. It's adjectival. So it's part of the helvetian state. Intulerat is the verb in ferro, which means to bring upon. And this is pluperfect. So the part of the helvetian state had brought upon. And then the direct object is calamitatem. That means disaster or calamity, and insignum means remarkable. And then populo romano means the Roman people. That's dative singular. So the part of the Helvetian state had brought a remarkable calamity upon the Roman people. That's the content of the relative clause. But notice that we don't have a relative pronoun that's referring to some previous antecedent. Usually, the antecedent would be before the relative clause. The relative pronoun here is quae, but pars really is the antecedent. We would expect it to say pars quae, the part which. So let's read it as the part which. 
So we'll flip the word order. So we'll say the part of the Helvetian state which had brought a remarkable calamity upon the Roman people. So moving on, ea princeps poinas per solvit. So ea is a form of isaia id. The antecedent for that is pars, which is also grammatically feminine. And then princeps means foremost. The verb is per solvit. Solvo, the verb solvo means to pay. And with pair on the front of it, it's an intensifying prefix. It means to very much pay or strongly pay. In English, we might say something like pay up or cough it up, you know, something that emphasizes the difficulty of having to pay something that's costly. And then poinos means penalties or punishment. So he has this relative clause here where he says, the part of the Helvetian state which had brought a remarkable calamity upon the Roman people, Ea, that one. So he's using Ea to emphasize it's that canton, it's that district. So we'll translate this section here from Ea to Persolwit as it foremost paid the penalties. So look at what Caesar is saying here. He's saying that he got revenge on the Tigorini district who had embarrassed and humiliated Rome 50 years before. And what's his comment? He says, whether by chance or by the plan of the immortal gods. He's suggesting that maybe the gods planned it out that he would get this revenge, which to me speaks to his sense of entitlement, that the gods are on his side. And another way to think about this is put yourself in the place of an ancient Roman reader reading this stuff. If you're an ancient Roman and you're literate and you can read this history, you might really be gratified to think that maybe the gods planned out this glorious revenge, mentioning famous men from the past and avenging them. You know, for the ancient Romans, the aristocracy, that is, their ancestors were a big deal to them. If you were an aristocratic man, you were expected to live up to the accomplishments of your ancestors. In a wealthy Roman home, you might even have statues or busts of the famous men of your family. So they're always sort of, you know, there keeping an eye on you. And so a lot of pressure on Roman aristocratic men to get out there and make a name for themselves. So the idea of avenging something that was done to a, a relative, avenging something that was done to a great Roman of the past, the idea that maybe the gods planned it out, this might be very gratifying to an ancient Roman aristocrat reading this kind of thing. And we get more of this on the next line. Qua in re, Caesar non solum publicas, sed etiam privatas in iurias, ultus est. Qua in re means in which thing, in the sense of in which doing, or in which deed, or in which act. And then Caesar is the subject. Ultus est is the verb ulciscor, which means to avenge. That's a deponent verb, and ultus is a perfect participle. So along with est, it says, he avenged. This is a gendered verb, and so we know that ultus is masculine because it's got the masculine U-S ending. So Caesar plus ultus plus est, those three words say Caesar avenged. And what did he avenge? Injurias, injustices. So non solum publicas says not only public, and then sed means but, etiam means also, and privatas means private. So in which deed Caesar avenged not only public, but also private injustices. Moving on, the L's here stand for the Roman name Lucius. 
And so you just have to read each of those in the appropriate case. Quod eus soceri, lucii pisonus awum, lucium pisonem legatum, tigurini eodem proilio quo cassium interfecerant. Again, Caesar is mentioning famous men of the past, relatives. He's talking about getting revenge for things done to his relatives. The verb here is interfecerant, that's pluperfect, and it says, they had killed, and the subject is Tigurini. So, the Tigurini had killed, and then awum means grandfather, and it's got some genitives with it. Eos sokeri means of his father-in-law, that's the noun soker. And then Pisonus is genitive. That's the name Piso. Piso, Pisonus. So it says the Tigurini had killed the Awum, the grandfather of his father in law, Lucius Piso. And it even gives the name of the grandfather of his father in law. His name is also Lucius Piso. And then we have the word legatum that shows that Lucius Piso, the grandfather of his own father-in-law, he was a legatus, meaning one of the top-ranking generals, a lieutenant general in that army. Aeodem Proilio says, in the same battle. Proilio is the second declension noun, proilium, which means battle, and Aeodem is ablative singular, along with proilio. So, in the same battle, And then we have quo, which is a relative pronoun. So if we read aeodem, proilio, and quo together, it says something like, in the same battle in which. And then cassium is a direct object. So you sort of have to read interfecerant with awum and with cassium. You have to read it into there twice. So this last section here, reads something like this. Quod means because, by the way. Uh, He says, he avenged public and private injustices. Again, we see the strong sense of entitlement here. Caesar views the fact that the Roman army was defeated and that some of their men were killed. He sees that as an injustice, that somehow there was just something unjust about that. Again, it's this attitude of how dare you, you know, fight against us and defeat us. We're the Romans. So it says, Caesar avenged injustices, and then we go into quote. So to squeeze everything in, let's translate it like this. Let's say, because the Tigurini had killed Lucius Piso, the lieutenant general, the grandfather of his father-in-law, Lucius Piso, in the same battle in which they had killed Cassius. So we had to read in interfecerant twice there to make it make sense in English. And that's probably what a Latin reader would have done too. They would have just kept in mind the verb interfecerant. Okay, that brings us to the end, not only of this lecture, but of the entire lecture series. If you have made it this far, I'd like to thank you for sticking with me through all these long, tedious lectures, and I really hope that this has helped you to get a grasp on the Latin language. In the future, I may add some things to this lecture series. I may add some additional lessons in which we do some readings together, maybe continue moving forward in Caesar's Gallic Wars. So keep your eyes peeled for some additional lectures which may appear in the future. But in the meantime, thanks for sticking with me through all these lectures, and I wish you the best of luck in your Latin studies.